You're not being you anymore. Yes, I am. What do you want from me? Do you want to take out my clothes again, Daddy? You're trying to be someone you're not. This is my body, okay? If I want to dye my hair or put a ring to my nose, that's my <laughs> choice. Not a child. I don't understand who you are. You listen to what? You're not listening to me. spoken in so long. I miss you. I know you felt you had to make your own life, to do things your own way. I'm sure at times you loved it. You felt certain you'd made the right choice. Other times, the darkness crept in. Emptiness that led to desperation and mistakes and misplaced trust. Hey! Some of the pain was your own doing. Some of the pain um. was caused by others it's okay. who took advantage of you. Get whatever you want. I think I like the Just red. Get them both. was it your doing? What is that? What's what? What is that? I don't and if know. you find I yourself you rejected, or lost. Let's go. Stop. Know there is something better. Stop. Let go of me. Just when you feel alone, me. listen for my voice. You are not alone. Mom. Dad. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and it'll get there early tomorrow morning. If you're not there, th that's fine. I mean, I'll just stay on the bus, I guess. Come by fire, come by rain. Come by boat. Come by plane. You are all I can't replace. How I love to see you again. Just tell me I'll be seeing you again. You can never run too far, or shout too loud, or be gone so long 
that you can't find your way home. Just tell me I'll be seeing you again. so he can show you his grace. God is a gracious God, and he longs to extend his amazing grace to us. This morning, we're going to focus on restoring grace. Let's read uh, Lamentations 5 and verse 21 out loud together. Would you read this with me? Restore us, O Lord, and bring us back to you again. Give us back the joys we once had. So follow along in your Bible as I read here in Luke chapter 15. We're going to read the entire uh, chapter, so uh, follow along in your Bible. Great chapter. Can't leave a verse out. Three stories, one parable. Luke 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all, all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Jesus continued. There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country. He began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing, so he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. 
Your brother has come, he replied. Your father's killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, You are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad. Because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, he was lost and is found. Here, perhaps more than any other place in the Bible, we get a glimpse of God's restoring grace. How God loves us and accepts us, and even when we choose to wander away and then choose to come home again. Quite honestly, this story resonates with each and every one of us because we know that we are the prodigal son or daughter. We are the lost sheep or lost coin who needs to be found. We are the people who have wandered away and we need to find our way back home again. Amazing grace. So we take a closer look at restoring grace together. Let's begin our study by looking at the scripture together. And as we work our way through this amazing parable here in Luke 15, I want you to notice three things with me. First of all, the purpose of the parable. Why did Jesus tell this story? What motivated him to tell this parable? Well, to find the answer, we need to look once again at verses 1 and 2. Would you do that with me? Look at them with me in the Bible. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. This was not the first time, nor would it be the last time, that Jesus heard this complaint from the Jewish leaders. Luke 5, verse 30, at the calling of the tax collector Matthew, the Jews asked, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Luke 7, verse 39, when Jesus' feet were anointed with tears and perfume of a prostitute, the Jews whispered, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Luke 19, verse 7, in the encounter with Zacchaeus, the tax collector, the religious leaders complained, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So how did Jesus respond to all of these criticisms? Well, Luke 5, verses 31 and 32, Jesus said, it's not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Luke 19, verse 10, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And here in Luke 15, Jesus once again associates with sinners, and once again the Jewish leaders complain, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And so how did Jesus respond? Look at verse 3. Then Jesus told them this In other words, the stories in Luke 15 are a response to the Jews' complaint. By the way, notice that the word parable here is singular. These three stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son are but one parable. They're a trilogy. They're three ways of saying one thing. And so the purpose of this parable is in response to the Jewish religious leader's complaint that Jesus would even think about welcoming, eating with, spending time with sinners. Which brings us then to the plot of the parable. Now we've already read the three stories, so we won't read them again, but let me just summarize them and highlight some important details. The first story has to do with the lost sheep, verses 4 through 7. It's about a shepherd and his flock of a hundred sheep. In other words, it was a common everyday illustration that those in Jesus' immediate audience would certainly understand. 
What they wouldn't understand is that the text says that the shepherd loses one of them, one of the sheep. That's a heartbreaking twist in the plot of the story. If we would have been present when Jesus told the story, we probably would have heard a collective gasp from everyone in the audience because shepherds just don't lose sheep. The Bedouin shepherds knew their sheep by name, and their sheep knew the shepherd by voice. But as sheep tend to do, evidently, this sheep wandered away. The sheep got separated from the rest of the flock and became lost, which is a picture of us, you understand. As Isaiah 53 and verse 6 puts it, we all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own and so the shepherd does what any good shepherd would do. In Jesus' own words in verse 4, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? Rhetorical question, implied answer, yes, of course. And when he finds the lost sheep, he rejoices. In fact, he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. Now, the second story is about the lost coin in verses 8 through 10. It's about a woman and her ten silver coins. The Greek indicates they were drachmas, a coin that was worth about a day's wages, and she loses one. Another collective gasp from the audience. Assuming this woman was the one in her household who was primarily responsible for shopping the local market for the food and the necessities for her family, this coin was quite valuable, perhaps one-tenth of her entire monthly budget for such needs. And again, Jesus poses a rhetorical question in verse 8. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? Implied answer, yes! <laughs> Of course. Now please understand that the houses in the first century were very dark. The floors were often of dirt or rough cut stone. Mm -hmm. and it would be very easy for a small coin to become lost and very difficult once it was lost to find it. But the woman doesn't give up. <laughs> She stays after it until she does so, and when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. Which brings us to the third story about the lost son in verses 11 through 32. It's about a father and his two sons. In verse 12, Jesus says, The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, the collective gasp of the audience would have been unmistakable at this point. Why? Because this request went against every Jewish law and tradition. First of all, the rightful heir of the estate was the older son, not the younger son. Second, by making this request, the younger son was putting everyone else in his family in jeopardy. He was selfishly requesting my share of the estate, which he really wasn't entitled to, at the expense of the rest of the family's daily needs. And third, he was bringing disgrace upon not only his father and family, but upon the entire community in which he lived. Please understand that when someone in the family wasted a part of the family's estate in such a manner, there was actually a public ceremony held in the village square where a jar of grain was thrown down and shattered, proclaiming that the person, in this case the younger son, was no longer a productive member of the family or the community. He was, in fact, publicly disgraced and permanently disowned, forfeiting all rights and privileges as both a family member and as a citizen. Now, the father was very aware of this consequence, and yet Jesus says he divided his property between his sons. Anyway. 
Now, what happens next is predictable. The younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, a Gentile country, we would take that to be, and there he squandered his wealth in wild living. And then he loses it all. A famine comes. And to add further disgrace to the story, Jesus says this younger son hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. Now the audience's gasp has become a loud groan, you understand. <laughs> despicable and I am sure that there were some in the crowd who shouted well he got what he deserved but Jesus isn't finished with his story it's his story you understand right look again at verses 17 through 19 when he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And now the audience's groans have turned to a cry. <laughs> no way! This is not going to happen. Never, ever, ever, ever. Doesn't this ingrate realize that he no longer has any rights or privileges? Doesn't he understand that he cannot go back to his father even as a servant? Who does he think he is? What a fool! And yet look at what Jesus says in verse 20. In fact, let's read this out loud together. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now Jesus' audience was indignant. Impossible. You've got to be kidding me. What a crazy story. This would never happen. But it's not their story. It's Jesus' story, isn't it? Yeah. And it did happen. And the father not only welcomed his son, but he fully restored to him all of the rights of sonship, as evidenced, by the way, by the robe, the ring, and the sandals. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Boy, that was a great story. Oh, wait a minute. It's not done yet. <laughs> Jesus isn't finished, is he? The rest of the story. There's still the older son. The older brother. And in verses 25 through 32, you do understand that that's the real punchline for the entire parable. This older son, the older brother, hears the music and dancing, and he asks his servant, what is going on? And when he's told that it's a celebration because his younger brother has returned, this Older brother, older son goes ballistic. <laughs> and he wants nothing whatsoever, even with his father's pleas, to do with this celebration. And you do understand that most of the people in the audience around Jesus were going, yeah, I wouldn't either. Which we'll get to in a moment. So that's the plot of the parable. Three stories about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son, which leads us then to the point of the parable. What's the point? What's the moral of the story here? What's the main truth? What's the overall key principle that Jesus was attempting to teach us in these stories, this parable? And once again, then we've got to go back to verses 1 and 2. Jesus told these stories, this parable, in response to the criticism that he received from the Jewish religious leaders that he welcomes sinners and eats with them. And therefore, I think that the point that he was trying to make was twofold in nature. First, 
He was trying to justify his own reception of sinners. Jesus told this parable to justify his own reception of sinners. Just as a good shepherd goes after the lost sheep, just as a poor woman searches carefully for her lost coin, just as a concerned father looks for and longs for and welcomes home his lost son, so Jesus' very purpose is to seek and to save the lost. But I think there's a flip side to Jesus' point. And this is where the real dig comes in. Second, Jesus told these stories, this parable, to judge the Jews' rejection of sinners. To judge the Jews' rejection of sinners. The Jewish leaders knew that they were the older brother, the older son. As Jesus told this last, perhaps unexpected part of the parable... In the story of the lost son, they understood that they stood condemned by Jesus' words. This was like a punch in the gut. And they didn't like it. Guaranteed. But they got the point. Well, that's a look at the scripture. Now, what lessons can we learn from our study today? As I said at the outset of today's lesson, I think that this parable gives us a glimpse of God's restoring grace. How he loves us and accepts us when we choose to wander away and when we decide to come home again. And as I see it, I can identify at least five characteristics of restoring grace right here in Luke chapter 15. Let me just highlight them for us for our own personal consideration and application. Number one, restoring grace reproves our gracelessness. Restoring grace reproves our gracelessness toward sinners. Let's get the negative one of these five out of the way first, shall we? This is Jesus' judgment of the Jews' rejection of sinners. Jesus turns their criticism of him back onto them. Of course, he welcomes sinners. That's the point of this parable. And that is by the way of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. Yes, and in light of this, Jesus says, wait a minute, time out here. Even as I have chosen to receive sinners, I want you to know that you have a tendency to reject. tells the Pharisees and teachers of the law that they're the older brother, the older son. So how does that apply to you and me? Well, whatever else we may learn from the older brother and son, we learn, I think, that our hearts tend to be graceless. Ouch. It's hard to swallow, but it's true. Let me just get right to the how would we do today if someone well known to us as a criminal, a murderer, a rapist, walked through the doors of our church and came right down and sat here in the front row to worship with us? How would we respond? Let me just throw out a name. Jeffrey Dahmer. Remember him? You know what bothers me the most about the life of Jeffrey Dahmer? It's not that he was a cannibal and did some of the most horrific things ever imaginable. He took brutality, he took sin, he took degradation lower than it had ever been before in history. What bothers me is not the vision that I still have in my mind of seeing him in the courtroom as the sentence is pronounced upon his life and his steely cold eyes or his lack of remorse. You know what bothers me the most about Jeffrey Dahmer? His conversion. Just a few months before a fellow inmate took Jeffrey Dahmer's life, did you know that he repented, he was baptized, he began to read his Bible, and every day went to chapel. 
And everything inside of me wants to cry out, No! Not that easy! Doesn't happen that way. God's grace is meant for sinners like me, not deviants like you. Again, if Jeffrey Dahmer or some other person like him walked into our church to worship among us this morning, how would we respond? Galatians 6 and verse 1 tells us someone is trapped in sin. You should gently restore that person back to the right path. And the point is, whoever God is willing to restore, we must be willing to restore. Whoever God accepts by his grace, we must be willing to accept by his grace. That is exactly, folks, what restoring grace is all. So first, restoring grace reproves our gracelessness towards sinners. It's a hard point, but we need to learn it. Number two, restoring grace reveals God's heart for the lost. Restoring grace reveals God's heart for the lost. All three stories in this parable picture God's heart for those who are lost. The lost sheep, the shepherd leaves 99 to go out and find the one. The lost coin, the woman doesn't give up until she finds that one coin that was lost. The lost son, the father never loses hope. By the way, do you, do you notice in the story he never stops scanning the horizon, always anxiously awaiting the possible return of his son? I don't know how long his son was, done, was gone. Uh, weeks, months, maybe years. But it says while he was still a long way off, he saw him. Which means he was looking for him. Every day. These stories show us a God who has a heart for the lost. A God who will do whatever is necessary to find those who are lost. Let's read 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 out loud together. Would you read this with me? God is restraining himself on account of you, holding back the end because he doesn't want anyone lost. He's giving everyone space and time to change. Don't miss that. He doesn't want anyone lost. Anyone. That's God's heart. Write this down in your notes. Lost people matter to God. Lost people matter to God. And you know what? If lost people matter to God, then lost people ought to matter. If God is willing to do whatever it takes to find those who are lost, then we ought to be ready and willing to do whatever it takes to find those who are lost. May God's heart become our heart here at Springville Naz as we do anything and everything possible to help the lost and the prodigals find their way home. I pray that we become a center for restoring grace. So second, restoring grace reveals God's heart for the lost. Number three, restoring grace recognizes why people get lost. Restoring grace recognizes why people get lost. And basically the reason why people get lost is free will. Free will. Choice. Sometimes they wander away unknowingly like the lost sheep. Sometimes they wander away knowingly, like the lost son. But in either case, it is their choice. It's an exercise of their own free will. To, to put it simply, people have a right to be wrong. Think about that for a minute. God made us that way so that we wouldn't just be puppets. <laughs> He gave us the ability to choose, and we have the right to be wrong if we choose to be so. Not only is falling away and getting lost our choice, but we're actually prone to exercise our free will wander. You ever notice that? <laughs> How easy it is to wander. <laughs> it's in our nature to get lost. And I'm not just talking here about men who don't stop to ask directions. <laughs> 
That's why the term lost sheep is used so often in the Bible. To be blunt, sheep are dumb. They tend to get lost. Folks, it's not a compliment. You do understand this. It's not a compliment for us to be called sheep. <laughs> and the picture that Jesus paints of the prodigal wallowing in the pig pen is intended to be shocking and disgusting. As a result of his own free will, because of his own rebellious choices, this younger son, younger brother, made a total mess of his life. 2 Peter chapter 2 describes it like this. When a person has escaped the wicked ways of the world by learning about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and then gets tangled up with sin and becomes its slave again, he is worse off than he was before. There's an old saying that a dog comes back to what he has vomited and a pig is washed only to come back and wallow in the mud again. That is the way it is with those who turn again to their sin. Free will. You have the choice to wallow in the pig pen. God will allow you to do that. But you also have So third, restoring grace recognizes why people get lost. Number four, restoring grace relinquishes the past for the future. Restoring grace relinquishes the past for the future. Certainly one of the most touching scenes in these three stories is that of the father running to meet his lost son, throwing his arms around him and kissing him. And then as the son tries to say his rehearsed speech, I'm not worthy to be your son, blah, 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 blah. The father interrupts him in verses 22 through 24. Look at them again in your Bible. Verse 22, but the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his finger, sandals on his feet, bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Wow. <laughs> you see, the father had every right to demand apology. Every right to demand full restitution before accepting his wayward son home again. In fact, this was not even his son, you understand. He had already lost all rights and privileges as a son and as a citizen in the community. This scene should not have even been happening. But Jesus is telling the story. I like Jesus' story. And certainly repentance, I think, is implied by the son's attitudes and actions. But which parent among us, come on, be honest, which parent among us could have resisted a speech at such a moment as this? I told you so. <laughs> if you had only listened to me. But the father doesn't dwell on the past. Instead, he looks to the future. And the best robe, the family ring, the sandals, the fattened calf are all freely given. Did the son deserve those things? No! But that's exactly the point. That's why we call it amazing grace. Yes, amen. Thank you, I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that when God looks at us, he isn't concerned about the past. He's concerned about the when God looks at me, he doesn't care where I've been or what I've done. All he cares about is where I'm going and what I'm going to do. He doesn't condemn me. No, he sets me free. And by his grace, he takes me just as I am, and he changes me so that I am never the same again. So forth, restoring grace relinquishes the past for the future. Number five, restoring grace rejoices when restoration is complete. Restoring grace rejoices when restoration is complete. All three of the stories tall, talk about joy. Do you notice that? Verses five through seven, when the lost sheep is found, there's joy for the shepherd, and he shares it with his neighbors. Verses nine and ten, when the lost coin is found, the woman calls together her friends and rejoices with them. Verse 32, when the lost son comes home, look at what it says again. I had to put this one up there. We had to celebrate and be glad. Do you notice what it said? 
We had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost as, and is found. See, nothing, absolutely nothing is more thrilling to God than when a lost person All of heaven rejoices, Jesus says. The angels celebrate. The Father throws a party, all because someone who's wandered away has come home again. And if God gets excited when someone is restored, we ought to hoop and holler whenever someone repents and turns to God. Celebrate good times. Come on. So fifth, restoring grace rejoices when restoration is complete. As I see it, I can identify at least five characteristics of restoring grace here in Luke 15. It reproves our gracelessness towards sinners. We don't like to hear that, but we must. It reveals God's heart for the lost. It recognizes why people get lost, free will. It relinquishes the past for the future. And it rejoices when restoration is complete. Amazing grace. This morning we've taken a closer look at what the Bible says about God's restoring grace here in Luke chapter 15. How God loves and accepts us when we choose to wander away and when we choose to come home. Again. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have chosen in your wisdom to include the, these incredible stories, this parable in your word, because we need to hear it. We need to understand your restoring grace. Teach us, oh God, these lessons, that we might truly understand how absolutely, incredibly amazing your grace really is. <clears throat> May we apply these lessons now to our lives. 